The strange but true story featured on this podcast contains details some people may find distressing. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Chaya Samuel and things are about to get weird. Hello there my fellow strange but true story enthusiasts and welcome to another episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. This is a podcast dedicated to some of the wildest stories you're ever likely to hear. It's part true crime, part unsolved mysteries with a dash of unexplained phenomena and a sprinkling of the unsettling. The stories that I'm drawn to are usually full of unbelievable coincidences and strange twists and turns. If all of that sounds like your cup of tea, make yourself comfy because you're definitely in the right place. In today's episode, I'm going to be telling you the astonishing story of a lady called Violet Jessup. Now, if you're a history geek like me, you might have heard of her name before as she was one of the 214 crew members on board the Titanic who did survive the disaster. But believe it or not, that's actually just one part of her incredible strange but true life story. Now, I think I've always had an interest in the Titanic, which 100% stemmed from watching the film as a kid. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm sure I was probably a little bit too young to watch it the first time I did, to be honest, but it definitely stuck with me and it led to a bit of a fascination with other films based on disasters. The one that comes to mind is that Sylvester Stallone movie, Daylight, which I had on VHS and I used to watch it over and over and over again. I know Daylight's not based on a real disaster, but I think at the time I thought it was. Anyway, in 2017, I was in Las Vegas with my dad and my sister. We went for my dad's 60th birthday and we decided to go to the Titanic Artifact exhibition, which is in the Luxor. And whilst I was completely up for it, I didn't realise exactly how completely enthralled I'd be by it. I think there were around 250 different artefacts from the actual wreckage of the ship and loads of information that I never knew before visiting. It really was amazing. It definitely sparked up a whole new level of interest in the Titanic for me. And when I started reading Violet's story, I was so hooked in that I knew I had to tell you all about her too. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Violet Constance Jessup. What a name. Violet was born on the 2nd of October, 1887 in Argentina, and she was the daughter of an Irish couple, William and Catherine Jessup. The couple had nine children, all in all, but sadly only six of those children would survive. Violet was the eldest, and as you can imagine, this meant she spent a lot of her own childhood helping to take care of her younger siblings. On top of this, we know that part of Violet's childhood was particularly tough, as she became very ill with what doctors suspected to be tuberculosis. Now, at this time, tuberculosis was commonly called the robber of youth, as it had such a high mortality rate, especially amongst young sufferers. However, for Violet, this would mark the first occasion in her life that she would beat the odds when things looked their bleakest. Though doctors told her family the illness would very, very likely be fatal, Violet survived and made a full recovery. The Jessops remained in Argentina until Violet was 16 years old and it was at this time that tragedy struck the family. Her father, William, had been in surgery for an unknown affliction when complications arose and he actually passed away as a result. William had been a sheep farmer in Argentina, but with six children now to raise alone, Catherine decided it was best to move the family back to Europe and they actually settled in England with Catherine taking up a job as a stewardess for the Royal Mail Line, which was a huge shipping company. This kind of job would have involved general housekeeping tasks and errands, and it was obviously an incredibly demanding career path, as it meant Catherine would be working away at sea. After she took the job, her four sons were placed into an orphanage, and Violet was left to care for her younger sister, who was called Eileen. The two eventually moved into a convent school in Kent, which is in the south of England, and Violet was able to continue her studies there. 
However, after a few years of working aboard the ships, their mother Catherine's health started to decline and she eventually became too ill to continue working. Violet felt that as the eldest child, she had a responsibility to look after her family financially and at the age of just 21, she chose to follow in her mum's footsteps and applied to become a stewardess. Now, in disappointing but not surprising 20th century style, she actually struggled to find work initially as her would-be employers were concerned that her good looks would, quote, cause problems with passengers and fellow crew members. Hmm, I think we all know who the real problems would have actually been in this situation, and it certainly wasn't Violet or her looks, but I digress. Anyway, Violet was determined to work as a stewardess and to be able to support her family, so she ended up altering her looks to appease those in charge of hiring, making herself look plainer, frumpy in her words, and she was eventually given a job working aboard a Royal Mail Line steamer called the Orinoco in 1908. Although she only worked a short stint on this ship, it really kick-started her career. And only four years later, on the 10th of April, 1912, 24-year-old Violet boarded a luxurious new ship as a first-class stewardess. And that vessel was, of course, the RMS Titanic. Violet was actually pretty reluctant to take the job aboard the Titanic, as the route that it would take across the North Atlantic was notorious for not being that great. The weather conditions could be terrible and it was quite likely that she'd experienced some very demanding passengers along the way, but she was convinced by a friend of hers that it would be an incredible experience and she ended up accepting the job. I can totally understand why there was a huge buzz around this new ship and this journey would be its maiden voyage, so it really would have seemed like a great opportunity. But as we all know, the Titanic would sadly never reach New York City. Just days after setting sail from Southampton, the ship struck an iceberg at around 11.40pm on the 14th of April, and approximately two hours and 40 minutes later, it had completely sunk into the North Atlantic Ocean. At the time, it was the deadliest sinking of a single ship on record, with an estimated 1,517 people losing their lives, although this number is widely debated as the total passenger number wasn't thought to be accurate in the first place. And to this day, it's still regarded as one of the worst peacetime maritime disasters in history and certainly the most famous. Again, these numbers tend to vary depending on the source, but it's believed around 492 passengers and 214 crew members were saved after being rescued from their lifeboats by RMS Carpathia, which arrived at the scene around two hours after the Titanic sank. Violet Jessup was one of the crew members who were rescued, and in her memoirs, she wrote about what she experienced during those terrifying hours between the ship striking the iceberg and being rescued. She was actually in her bed when the accident initially happened, describing herself as comfortably drowsy. Now, Violet was a devout Catholic, and as she'd been lying in her bunk that night, she and her roommates had been reading a translated copy of a Hebrew prayer that she'd been given by an elderly Irish lady. It was clearly very precious to Violet as she'd brought it with her on her journey, and she remembers that the prayer was strangely worded and was supposed to protect her against fire and water. Not long afterwards, the fatal collision occurred, and Violet explains that, quote, I was ordered up on deck. Calmly, passengers strolled about. I stood at the bulkhead with the other stewardesses, watching the women cling to their husbands before being put into the boats with their children. Sometime after, a ship's officer ordered us into the boat first to show some women it was safe. As the boat was being lowered, the officer called, Here, Miss Jessup, look after this baby. And a bundle was dropped onto my lap. Her memoirs make mention of Thomas Andrews, the naval architect of the Titanic, who tragically lost his life on board. Violet evidently had a huge amount of respect for him, as did the crew in general, and she also wrote about the Scottish violinist, Jock Hume, who it's believed she was friends with. I'm sure we all remember the scenes in the Titanic film with the violinists. I know for me, those scenes had a huge impact on me. They still make me cry every time I watch it. 
Violet was placed into lifeboat 16 and she was there for eight hours until she was rescued by RMS Carpathia. She wrote, I was still clutching the baby against my hard cork life belt I was wearing when a woman leaped at me and grabbed the baby and rushed off with it. It appeared that she put it down on the deck of the Titanic when she went off to fetch something and when she came back, the baby had gone. I was too frozen and numb to think it's strange that this woman had not stopped to say thank you. Now, of course, every Titanic survival story is amazing. It was unbelievable that RMS Carpathia was able to reach them so quickly and that so many were rescued from the lifeboats. The thing is, this was not the first time that Violet Jessup had survived a ship collision. The year before the Titanic's voyage in 1911, Violet was working as a stewardess on board another White Star Line vessel, that was the company that owned the Titanic, and it was called the RMS Olympic. Now, this was another huge, very luxurious ship. In fact, at the time, it was the largest civilian vessel in operation. Despite the fact that she was working 17-hour days, Violet was happy with her job aboard the Olympic, and this was another reason she was hesitant to leave and join the crew of the Titanic when the opportunity came up. However, her time working on the Olympic had not been without major incident. After completing three voyages aboard the ship, which had taken passengers from Southampton to New York City, Violet was once again on board the Olympic when it set sail on its fifth voyage from Southampton on the 20th of September 1911. At the helm was Captain Edward Smith, and if you think you recognise his name, it's because he was also the captain of the Titanic. So, not long after setting off from Southampton on the 20th of September, the Olympic and another ship, HMS Hawk, were travelling parallel to one another through the Solent, which is a strait of water between the landmass of Great Britain and the Isle of Wight. If you imagine a map of Great Britain, it's kind of in the middle at the very bottom of England. As the Olympic turned within the strait, it came as a surprise to the Hawk and the two ships collided, causing substantial and serious damage to both vessels. But luckily, both the Olympic and the Hawk managed to make it back to port and neither completely sank. Although when you see the photographs of both ships after the collision, it's really quite amazing that they were able to get back to land without total disaster. Two enormous holes were torn in the Olympic's hull and two of its watertight compartments were flooded, which must have been very unsettling for Violet and all of those on board. The Hawk actually completely lost its bow. It was totally mashed and flattened by the force of the crash. This part of the ship was specifically designed to ram and sink enemy ships. So the fact that this part is what hit the Olympic was very bad news. And this is why the damage was so severe. There was actually a trial to determine who or what was at fault in this incident. And it was eventually concluded that the Hawk was not responsible and that the huge amount of water that had been displaced by the Olympic as it made its way through the Solent created a kind of suction that drew the Hawk off course. Interestingly, the fact that the Olympic had been able to stay afloat after such a serious collision played a part in ships of this class gaining their reputation of being unsinkable, something we all remember was said about the Titanic, as both ships were owned and operated by the White Star Line. Fortunately, miraculously really, no one was killed or badly injured in the Olympic and Hawk incident, and Violet was able to safely disembark the ship once it reached port. Strangely, this incident would have a direct knock-on effect on the Titanic's maiden voyage. Because the Olympic required such involved and complex repairs, resources which were meant for the Titanic were reassigned to the Olympic to help get the ship back up and running again. This meant that the Titanic's departure date was moved to what we famously know to be the 10th of April 1912, when it was originally meant to be the 20th of March. It's just one of those strange butterfly effect type moments that makes you wonder whether all of the awful events that took place on the Titanic's fateful first journey might have played out differently if it had sailed on its original voyage date. I know it's completely impossible to say, of course, but 
it's really odd to think about. It's definitely the kind of thought that keeps me awake at night. Now, you'd think that after surviving not only the most famous ship sinking of all time, but a previous collision earlier in her career, that Violet could surely not be unfortunate enough to experience an incident of this kind ever again. But you'd be wrong. As I'm sure we all know, 1914 spelled the start of the First World War, and in addition to the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who fought in the British Army, there were around 90,000 people who volunteered for the British Red Cross. They were known as VADs, or Voluntary Aided Detachments, and our Violet was one of them. She volunteered to serve as a stewardess and also a nurse, according to some sources, for the British Red Cross. And by November 1916, she was serving aboard the HMHS Britannic. Bizarrely, this was yet another White Star Line ship. It was actually the younger sister ship of the Titanic and the Olympic, and it had been converted into a hospital ship after the war had broken out. Honestly, I have no idea how Violet didn't see this as a huge red flag, and I can only imagine that she was not at all superstitious, because regardless of her experiences with White Star Line ships, she chose to board the vessel and volunteer her services to help in the war effort. Tragically, on the morning of the 21st of November 1916, the Britannic was rocked by a deafening and, at the time, unexplained explosion while steaming at full speed through the Aegean Sea. The force of the explosion was felt very differently within different parts of the ship. For example, the doctors and nurses who were in the dining room at the time realised immediately that something very serious had happened and left for their posts. But others thought the ship had just hit a smaller boat and there was nothing to worry too much about. But the severity of the situation was soon evident to everyone. The watertight compartments of the ship rapidly began to fail and fill with water, and even though there had been new safety design measures introduced after the Titanic disaster to ensure the Britannic could have a better chance of staying afloat in an event like this, the damage was just too extensive. Whilst the Britannic could have continued to float with even six of these watertight compartments flooded, With it being a hospital ship, there were a large number of open portholes around the lower decks to help with ventilation. And whilst these shouldn't have technically been open, it didn't matter now, it was simply too late. Just 55 minutes after the explosion had taken place, the Britannic sank into the ocean, sadly killing 30 people on board. Violet Jessup, however, was not one of them. Before the ship sank, most of the 1,066 people on board had been able to escape in the Britannic's 35 lifeboats, although this was absolutely not a straightforward evacuation. When the crew had realised how rapidly the ship was sinking, they had started to deploy the lifeboats without first waiting for the order from the ship's captain, Charles Alfred Bartlett. This meant that the ship's engines were still running as Captain Bartlett was trying everything to manoeuvre the vessel in an attempt to beach it on a nearby Greek island, but it didn't take long for him to realise it was just not going to work. He did stop the engines, but unfortunately not in time to prevent another horrific incident from taking place that morning. Two lifeboats that were being lowered towards the water, full of passengers from the Britannic, were sucked into one of the boat's propellers and were completely obliterated by the huge turning machinery. It's just horrible. Violet was on board one of the lifeboats heading towards the propeller. In what I can only imagine was a matter of seconds, she made the unthinkable decision to jump from the lifeboat into the ocean below. In her memoir, Violet wrote about this experience, saying, I leapt into the water but was sucked under the ship's keel, which struck my head. I escaped, but years later when I went to my doctor because of a lot of headaches, he discovered I had once sustained a fracture of the skull. She was such a badass, she didn't even realise she'd sustained a traumatic head injury, and miraculously, she had once again survived the kind of maritime disaster a person would not want to experience once in a lifetime, let alone three times in five years. 
Violet wrote that she believed her thick auburn hair had helped to, I guess, cushion the blow from this head injury, which is just another fascinating little detail in her wild life story. Local fishermen, as well as several Royal Navy ships, rescued the survivors from their lifeboats, and it's reported that many Greek citizens attended the funerals of those whose bodies were recovered from the wreckage. If you're wondering what caused the explosion on the Britannic, this has been a question that many people have tried to answer over the years. A number of diving expeditions to the wreckage, which is still in the Aegean Sea, have been done, but sadly, two divers have actually died during these missions. The first was Carl Spencer, who lost his life whilst filming the wreckage for the third time for National Geographic in 2009. And the second was a technical diver named Tim Saville, who lost his life during a dive in 2019. The consensus is that the explosion was caused either by a torpedo or a sea mine, and the mine theory is the one that I've read the most. Violet actually wrote about the final seconds of the Britannic before it fully sunk, saying, She dipped her head a little, then a little lower, and still lower. All the deck machinery fell into the sea like a child's toys. She then took a fearful plunge, her stern rearing hundreds of feet into the air until with a final roar, she disappeared into the depths, the noise of her going resounding through the water with an undreamt of violence. Now, if you were Violet and had survived not one, not two, but three disasters aboard White Star Line ships, what would you have done next? I know that personally, I would have never set foot off dry land ever again, and in particular, I would never have stepped onto another White Star vessel as long as I lived, but our Violet was clearly made of much sterner stuff than myself. In 1920, she took another job aboard a White Star Line vessel, and which one, you may ask? The good old Olympic, which had since been repaired after its collision with the Hawk. Finally, in 1926, Violet decided to leave the White Star Line company for the Red Star Line before eventually ending up back where she started working for the Royal Mail Line. She spent the rest of her career post-Britannic sinking, cruising around the world on a number of different ships, and although at one point in her late 30s Violet did marry, she described the union as brief and disastrous. She continued to work at sea until 1950 when she retired, moving to a 16th century thatched cottage in a place called Great Ashfield in the historic county of Sussex, which is in southeast England. But whilst Violet would thankfully never experience any further shipwrecks, that didn't mean she was entirely done with strange events cropping up in her life. Remember when I told you about Violet's escape from the sinking Titanic and how she was handed a baby before she got into lifeboat 16? Well, a few years after she retired on a stormy night in Sussex, Violet received a phone call from a woman whose voice she didn't recognise. The woman asked her whether she was the crew member who had rescued a baby on the night the Titanic sank, and Violet confirmed that she was. The woman simply answered... I was that baby, before hanging up the phone. Now, the records do show that there was a baby on board Lifeboat 16, a boy who was reunited with his mother after the passengers in the lifeboat had been rescued from the ocean. But could it be possible that in the utter chaos and confusion of that night, every single record kept wasn't totally accurate? It's something to think about for sure, especially considering that Lifeboat 16 is known to be one of the least well-documented rescue boats and less is known about it than many of the others. Additionally, when Violet first spoke of this incident to her biographer, a man called John Maxtone Graham, he suggested it was just, you know, local children playing a practical joke on her. But Violet's response to this was, no, John, I had never told that story to anyone before I told you now. Now, as we know from Violet's account, once she'd been rescued from the lifeboat, we know that the woman had come up to her and snatched the baby very quickly. So the fact that Violet had never spoken to anyone about this aspect of her Titanic rescue experience before, combined with the way the baby was taken from her as soon as she was rescued, it feels to me that there's every chance that perhaps the child was a little girl and simply hadn't been recorded as a lifeboat 16 survivor. 
Had it been common knowledge that Violet had carried a baby on the lifeboat, I probably wouldn't have given the idea a second thought, really. I'd probably have just assumed it was someone playing a prank on her. But considering she kept this information to herself for years and years, I think it could well have been the woman on the phone. Super, super strange, but very in keeping with Violet's life experiences. Violet was given the nickname of Miss Unsinkable and she lived a quiet but fulfilled life looking after her garden and the flock of hens that she kept in her cottage filled with items that reminded her of her many years at sea. Violet passed away in 1971 at the age of 83 and she was one of the very few Titanic survivors who left behind memoirs but thankfully due to her writings were able to know so much more about her amazing life story. Violet never had children, although her nieces said that she loved babies and kids, and by all accounts, she was incredibly selfless and a very helpful person who went above and beyond whenever she was called on, which I think is incredibly evident. I so wish that Violet had been one of the real people depicted in the Titanic movie. I could totally picture a subplot featuring her and her experiences. But although she wasn't directly featured, there was a minor character called Lucy in the film who, if you remember, she was the stewardess who runs into the shipbuilder, Thomas Andrews, in a corridor as the ship is sinking and he tells her to put on her life belt to set an example to the other passengers. It's believed that Lucy was based on or inspired by both Violet and another stewardess who was called Lucy Snape. I think if another Titanic film is ever made, using Violet's memoirs to help create a character fully based on her would be amazing. Now, if you've got to this point and you're thinking, wow, Violet's story is a one in a million, what are the chances, would never be seen again kind of deal, allow me to take this episode one step weirder. Violet was not the only person to survive three different shipwrecks during this time period. In fact, she wasn't the only person to survive the wrecking of the Olympic, the Titanic and the Britannic. Meet the unsinkable stoker, fireman Mr Arthur John Priest. Arthur's life story is actually even wilder than Violet's in many ways, as he survived additional ship sinkings and collisions as he worked on several different vessels during World War I. These ships include the SS Alcantara, which was sunk by a German merchant cruiser on the 29th of February 1916, and the SS Donegal, which was sunk as a result of enemy attack in April 1917. However, unlike Violet, Arthur didn't write any memoirs, so far less is known about his life and experiences. I so wish I could do a whole episode on him, but there just isn't enough information. What we do know is that he was born on the 31st of August, 1887 in Southampton, and was one of 12 children to be born to labourer Harry Priest and his wife Elizabeth Garner. Arthur married a lady named Annie Hampton in Birkenhead in 1915, and the couple had three sons named Arthur, George and Frederick. It's believed that Arthur was able to board lifeboat 15 on the Titanic, and although he suffered an injured leg and some frostbite, he was rescued with the lifeboat's other passengers. Very interestingly, according to some sources, two of Arthur's sisters, Nellie and Emily, both lost their boyfriends in the Titanic sinking, which would make a lot of sense given their connections with Southampton, where the vessel set sail from. It's reported that Nellie's boyfriend was a man called Joseph Dawson, a 23-year-old Irish soldier who I believe signed on to work on the Titanic as a coal trimmer, which was a very physically demanding and I imagine not all that pleasant job. Sadly, he didn't survive the disaster and if his name sounds familiar... Jay Dawson. It could be because Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the Titanic film is called Jack Dawson. Apparently, James Cameron wrote the character without realising this link, but nevertheless, his gravesite in Halifax, Nova Scotia, became somewhat of a shrine for fans of the movie. Sorry, I know that was a little bit of a tangent, but I thought it was really interesting. Getting back to Arthur, sadly, he didn't live as long of a life as Violet after all of their ordeals at sea, and he actually passed away 
at the age of just 49 on the 11th of February 1937 from pneumonia. He's buried in an unmarked grave in Hollybrook Cemetery in Southampton. I'm not sure why it's unmarked and I felt really sad when I read that. It's absolutely incredible that Arthur was working aboard those same three ships as Violet, the Olympic, the Titanic, the Britannic. I wonder if they ever met. I wonder if they knew each other. I mean, there were so many people aboard the ships that I guess it's quite unlikely, but it still makes you wonder because they were survivors of all three, whether they did know each other. But I really did want to mention Arthur at the end of this episode, our Mr. Unsinkable, if you like, because It is often the way that without additional material like memoirs, history does tend to forget or overlook people. So here's to both Violet and Arthur's completely astonishing survival stories. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this rather historical episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. These real life strange but true stories just really get me, especially when they're also amazing survival stories. I'm definitely one of those people who sits through every disaster movie or true crime podcast episode totally rooting for the people involved and the victims to survive against all odds and the way that Violet spoke about her experiences was really incredible. Time to give a nod to the sources which helped with my research for this episode. We have encyclopediatitanica.org, britannica.com, an article from Irish Central, Violet's memoir Titanic Survivor, a very old but very useful website called timemanic1912.com as well as good old Wikipedia. Thank you so much to everyone who has sent in suggestions and ideas for future episode topics. I really, really appreciate it. There are loads of ways to get in touch. So you can email me at thingsgetweirdpodcast at gmail.com or on Instagram at thingsgetweirdpodcast and the Twitter handle is at about to get weird. And there's also the Facebook page and the private discussion group as well. It's really fun over there. If you search things are about to get weird on Facebook, you'll find both of those. Just click the request to join button on the discussion group and I'll be sure to let you in. I honestly can't tell you how much your reviews and your ratings mean to me. So if you've enjoyed this episode, please do work your magic and leave me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen. It really does help so much and every single rating or review really does make my day. Thanks again for listening and until next time, take care of yourself and others and keep it weird, but the good kind of weird. (laughs) 